also, if you don't know who to pray for, pray for me. <laughs> pray one for another. Praise the Lord. And that God would be glorified. And also, let's remember Deacon Kleiss in prayer. I don't think he was feeling that well. Um, uh, just recently as we, as he, after he came in. So let's pray for him. Can somebody say pray for him. Praise the Lord. The Lord created these bodies, and thus these bodies um, uh, are under his control. He has the ability to touch these bodies and to give these bodies what they need. Can the church say amen? amen. As we have been teaching, we're going to continue teaching on the subject of Revelation, the book of Revelations, which is a deep revelatory book that deals with a subject which is known in theological ranks as eschatology and on the study of end time events. This has to do with the things um, that will occur in the final days and the final hours of time. And so as a place to start, someone asked me a question about what we were dealing with on last week. They're not here tonight, but I'm still going to answer this question uh, because somebody else may have a uh, question about it. But um, just so we can have a, a sense of, of um, some clarity, because I know some things, sometimes things can be lost in our memory from week to week. I want you to go back with me um, rather quickly to the book of Daniel, chapter number 10, verse 14. And I said in my comments, starting with, I think it was last week when we dealt, when we started this particular uh, lesson, that the book of Daniel is connected with the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is simply a sequel uh, to a certain degree of the book of Daniel's, Daniel because it deals with the 70th week of Daniel's vision that he received as the uh, close of the Babylonian captivity came to an end. Because Daniel prayed and he asked God what would happen to his people. And his people, of course, Sister Julian, was Israel. And so because of that, Daniel received exactly... Brother Bobby, what he asked for. And we tried to give you a quick summary without giving you all the scriptures um, that pertain to this particular 70 weeks in a Bible class on last week and show you that the book of Revelation is the 70th week of Daniel's vision. And this, of course, is the reason why when, as we gave you last week, when um, we talked about the reason why the book of Revelation was put into our canon of scripture. It is because the style of writing and the way in which uh, John is wrote is in direct connection in many cases to the way the prophets wrote of old, namely Daniel. And so they added this particular book instead of the other books that we showed you, such as the apocalypse. We, we talked about the apocalypse of Peter and some of the other books that were popular in that day because the book of Revelation was not a popular book in that particular day. And remember this, saints. I guess I got to give you this in passing. It took approximately, I would say, 30 years or more for the New Testament to be complete. See, as the apostles were preaching the gospel, they were preaching it, Sandy, from the Old Testament. And so the book of Revelation is the last book that was added to our canon, our canon of scriptures, our inspired writings, our canonicals, or what we call the Holy Bible. You follow me? You follow me? And so in that day, the book of Revelation was not a popular book, but because, but when the, um, when the translators of the Bible decided as to what book to add to, as God inspired them, of course, to our canonicals, in their studies, and as they're inspired by God, they saw that much of what John was talking about is the same thing that Daniel and the other prophets saw. So they added this book, or the book of Revelation that we're going to be studying, which is a study on end time events. They added that to our canonicals. Can the church say amen? So somebody said, well, pastor, what is the significance of us teaching this? Because remember, these things were given unto his servants. Who were his servants? The church. So the Lord wants us to be aware of the events, grace that is going to happen um, in the end times. Now, we are coming close 
to the fulfillment of many of these things in as much as we are in the church dispensation and the church dispensation is a period of 2,000 years and um, we're coming to the close of the church dispensation and the 70th week of Daniel. Can the church say amen? So I want you to read this scripture and this is simply a refresher just in case somebody wasn't here, maybe forgot so we can understand exactly how these things are going to be. Verse 14, now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. Now the latter days are the times in which we're in. There are four terms, I think it's, it's four terms that are used in the New Testament referring to our days. One of them is here, latter days, last days, last times, and end of the world. Jesus spoke of our time as the end of the world or the close of the finality of end time events or things that are going to take place. So the book of Daniel is a book that deals with the, many of the things that are going to take place concerning Israel and also the judgment of God to come in the times of the end. Somebody say the times of the end and we're drawing close to that. Can the church say amen? And the church needs to understand what God is going to do in the times that will be the, fin will be the finality of man. We need to understand this. Why do we need to understand it? So that we can prepare ourselves. Can the church say amen? Now, many of our fathers taught these Bible classes for many years. But the Bible said it like this, that the path of the just is as a shining light shining more and more into the perfect day. There were things that our fathers could not see in terms of some end time events because as we get closer to the fulfillment of a prophecy, there are things that we see that give us clues as to, to a certain degree how these things are going to be. It is not that they didn't understand, they had a full understanding based upon the knowledge that they had. And they were many of our fathers, such as the late Bishop Ellie Brisbane, the late Bishop Art Ross Perry Paddock, these men were accurate Bible teachers. They were, uh, these men had a clear understanding of many of these things that are gonna take place, but we see some things now that they didn't see then. Can the church say amen? amen. Some of the technologies that are in the earth that are gonna usher in the man of sin that is gonna come on the scene during the tribulation period, the things that he's going to do, the, 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 the vehicles that he will use to take power from the earth, power in the earth, I should say. So in any case, remember, saints, this is Daniel praying or this is his answer to his prayer as to Lord, what is going to happen with my what with, with my people? His people were who? Israel. Daniel lived through the whole Babylonian captivity all and, 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 the, uh, and the reign of the uh, medial Persian Empire, which they are under right now. Because remember, the Babylonians fell to the Medes and the Persians. And at this particular point in time, Cyrus is over them. Cyrus has them captive. Can the church say amen? But remember, he studied the prophecies of, De of, of Jeremiah, and he knew that the captivity would only be for 70 years. So now he's drawing to the close of that. So he's saying, okay, what is going to happen, Lord? What is going to take place for, for, uh, for my people? See, Daniel was not concerned about himself. He was concerned about his people. And so, as I said last week, God gave Daniel exactly what he asked for. What was going to happen with the children of Israel in the latter times? So the question that was asked me, and I'm going to give it to you the way it was written, what is going to take place in between, in between the seven weeks of years, or 49 years, and the three score in two years, or 62 weeks? Now, the answer to the question is nothing, because these, these weeks run consecutive, consecutive. They run together. So there's no separation between the two. The writer wrote in this fashion because the Bible is written in such a way that the natural man saints cannot pick it up and get an understanding. So when we go and read this, you're going to see it seems to be a gap in between these two periods. There is no gap. He just deals with the seven weeks and then shows you what will be accomplished during that time. 
and then he gives you another uh, three score in two weeks or 60 or 62 weeks or 434 years until the cutting off of the Messiah. But, the, but God did this intentionally because the natural man cannot pick this Bible up and get an understanding. You follow me? So the answer to the question is nothing because the, the weeks are consecutive. So there is no break within the weeks. He just simply shows you what it's going, how long it took for the, what was going to take place during the uh, seven weeks of 49 years. Then from that time, six, uh, three score and two weeks is what? 62. Three score. What is the score? 20. Three times 20 is what? 60. Plus two weeks, 62. Or 434 years. There was already 49 years, right? So that gives you 400 and what? 83 years if you add those years up. Because remember, these are not these are not seven day weeks. These are seven weeks of years, 70 weeks of years. You follow me? So there is no gap. So if anybody had that question, because we're going to read it, I guess we might as well read it right now so you can understand why, why this can be confusing to some. Let's start with verses numbers um, 24 of the ninth chapter. So I want us to clearly understand what this is dealing with. Then we're going to get, go back into the first chapter of the book of Revelation, and we're going to pick it up where we left off for the most part on um, last Wednesday. Can the church say amen? Read, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for the iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the, uh, and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So how many weeks was this? Seventy weeks. These are 70 years of weeks or 490 years because 70 times 7 is what? 490 years. And these, these weeks ran consecutive. Praise the Lord. Unto there was a break in these weeks with the what? Church dispensation. The only break within this, these weeks of years is between the 69th and the 70th week of this prophecy. So the book of Revelation picks up the 70th week of Daniel's vision. That's the reason why when we, when we study the book of Revelation and we go into the book of Daniel, you will see that they're synonymous in what they saw. Daniel is seeing what John is seeing 500 years earlier. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then, you follow, you follow me? Daniel didn't see you and I. He saw what was going to take place with Israel. Can the church say amen? That's the reason why I tell people like this, Israel is whose pie? It's God's pie. So I hear a lot of Bible teachers talk about the prophecies of Daniel, and they try to deal with it uh, from the standpoint of everything with the church, or they try to deal with it with Israel, and they get things mixed up because they don't understand biblical prophecy. You follow me? So we're going to try to rightly divide the word of truth on this subject so we understand exactly what God is going to do in this time. Can the church say amen? So there are five things here that are spoken of that is going to take place in these 70 weeks. There's a gap of 2,000 years in between the 69th and the 70th, and, and the 70th week. So let's read here. Know, therefore, and understand. So he wants us to know and what? Understand from, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, if, you, if we gave that scripture last week, that is, in, um, that is in Ezra chapter number 1, verses 1 through 3. Because it was this King Cyrus that was spoken of 164 years prior that he would be the one that would be the servant of God. And that it was this king that sent the decree to go forth and rebuild the temple or the temple of Jerusalem or the temple of what we call Zerubbabel's temple. And who's connected with that temple? Ezra and Nehemiah, because Nehemiah was a part of that time also. Nehemiah was the one that set order once that temple was complete. 
Isn't that right? Ezra was the scribe who recorded many of the events of that time. You remember what happened when they were going to build the walls, Sambad, Sambalat and Tobiah? It was this king that gave, gave Israel the decree to go and rebuild the temple. And it took them 49 years or seven weeks to do that. Read unto, uh, let's read here, unto the Messiah, the prince should come, shall be what? Seven weeks. And what? And three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the walls and what? Now, you see how the writer did this? The streets were going to be built during the what? The seven weeks. But he speaks of this what three score and what two weeks. So it's confusing to some because the Bible is not written in such a manner that you can read it like a novel. So it appears that this 70, this, this three score and two weeks, or yeah, these three score and two weeks has something to do with this seven weeks, but it doesn't. It's a different time. Praise the Lord. You follow me? So there are seven weeks to rebuild the temple. Praise the Lord. And then he explains what is going to take place after the, the, uh, uh, the three score and two weeks um, in verses numbers 26. And after what? Three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That is the cross. Praise the Lord. So the temple was rebuilt and what do you say, in, in uh, troublous times, and it took seven weeks. Then after that, there was a, then the time continued to go on for another uh, 62 weeks or 434 years. And then what happened? Messiah was what? Cut off. All right, let's read here. Uh, it says, and after uh, three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come Shall destroy the, uh, the uh, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, unto the end of the war, the desolation are determined. Now I want to give you this: Daniel is prophesying, and he's seeing what is going to take place during the tribulation period. This is what this deals with: the abomination that maketh desolate. That maketh desolate after the Antichrist will come in and make a covenant with Israel for one week and accomplish what their fathers could not accomplish in allowing them to rebuild the temple during the tribulation period and continue their temple worship. That's what Daniel is seeing here. But there was a preview of that. That event that was going to take place in 70 AD, praise the Lord, approximately 37 years after Christ had risen from the grave. So when he says the people of the prince, the people... Of this prince that, are going, that, was, that, that was going to come in his proper setting, in his proper time, praise the Lord, which was going to be the Antichrist, it would be the people of that prince that was going to come in and destroy the city. And who were that? The Romans. Because it was Titus and the Roman, Titus, the Roman general, and, the, and uh, Rome that came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So in that event, it showed us what people the Antichrist would come from. He would come, he would, he would come from Rome. You follow me? So there was a preview. But the preview was not the event. You know, I gave you the scripture last week that when uh, Jesus prophesied uh, where this individual saying where you see him standing where he ought not, that was Jesus speaking, Sister Richardson, specifically, saints, of the fact that if Israel would have believed God, this, this Roman general Titus would not have had to come in and destroy the temple in 70 AD. But because of their unbelief, Jesus looked at that temple and he said that not one stone will be sitting upon another. And approximately 37 years or so later, that temple came down in 70 AD. You follow me? But it would be that people that destroyed the temple that, would, that this Antichrist would come from. So the people, the people are the Romans. The, the, the prince that shall come is the Antichrist because that, that is what Daniel's seeing. He is seeing the abomination to make it desolate coming in its proper time during the 70th week of this vision. Praise the Lord. 
and or of this prophecy. See, the Antichrist is going to come in, but when he comes, saints, we're going to get into this as we go, he's not going to reveal himself as the Antichrist. He's going to be a Roman Jew. By his nationality, he will be a Jew. By his citizenship, he will be a Rome. Because remember this, there are Jews scattered throughout the whole world. They are American Jews. They are Messianic Jews. They are Russian Jews, right? They are Roman Jews. Because remember, the Jews would not make a covenant with anybody that is not a Jew. He's going to come from Rome, but he will be a Jew. He will have Jewish blood running through his veins, but he's going to be somebody, say, the devil. Can the church say amen? So, in essence, this is what is going to take place. Read verses 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how many weeks? So this is the last week. These week, this week does not run consecutively with the other 69 weeks. There is a gap of how many years? 2,000 years. And what God is doing right now, he's getting his Gentile bride together. But once he gets us together, Jacob's trouble starts. What is God going to do with Jacob? He's going to allow them to pass under the rod and receive their last whooping. Purge out the rebels. He's going to use this man of sin to do it. Somebody say the devil. See, whenever people don't listen to God, guess who's coming next? The devil. Praise the Lord. If I don't obey the gospel, there's going to be a man riding four horses named the Antichrist. And he's going to come through and going to tear up things. You follow what I'm trying to say here? Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's read here. Shall confirm the, uh, the covenant with many for one week. That is the Jews. Read. And in the midst. Now, what is... How, what is in the middle of seven? Three and a half. In the middle of the tribulation period, because the tribulation period is broken up into two parts. There's tribulation, then there is great tribulation, or the great day of his wrath. You follow me? Y'all looking at me? Y'all scared? Make the rapture. Hallelujah. So <laughs> I'm just being a little facetious. But the point is simply this. This is what is going to take place. Praise the Lord. And the first half of tribulation, God is concentrating on whooping Israel. It's called Jacob's trouble. Praise the Lord. Now, Jacob's trouble will spread throughout the whole world, but Jacob will be in trouble with God for the last time. Can the church say amen? Mm-hmm. Read. Uh, let me see. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrificing, sacrifices and the oblation to cease. Now, why is he going to cause it to cease? Because now those Jews that made a covenant with him are going to know that he's the devil. He's going to go into that temple, which is right now what sets on that, that, that site where that temple is going to be is the Muslim Mosque of Omar. He's going to come into that temple. He's going to sit down and say, I'm God. And I'm going to show you that in your Bible as we go along when he's going to do it. Praise the Lord. And he's going to be, he's going to say, I, I want everyone in the, in the earth to bow down and worship me. Wow. See, the devil is only concerned about itself. That's the reason why you, when you see people who are conceited and concerned about themselves and don't want to do anything for anybody, that is a, that is a, 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 how can I say, a manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist because the devil only cares about himself. He knows that he has a reservation with the lake that burns with fire. So he wants everybody to follow him. Wow. Wow. Praise the Lord. But when this, this uh, man of sin comes in, he's going to come in with flatteries. He's going to come in speaking peace. But the Bible said when they cry peace and safety, then comes sudden, somebody say destruction. So what God is doing right now, he's getting us together. So we're going to get in the book of Revelation. You're going to see this last week that Daniel is, is seeing right here. Are you following me? Let's finish reading here. Uh, for the abomination, uh, he says, for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make desolate even unto the consumption, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Can the church say amen? Now let's go to Revelation, chapter number one. This is going to be a time such as has never been seen. And the worst part of it won't be what Satan 
um, in, uh, in the beast is going to do is actually what God is going to do to the earth because they failed to follow God. So somebody say, God knows exactly what he's doing. And no one's getting away with anything. Revelation chapter 1. This is what we're going to pick up in the book of Revelation. Praise the Lord. This is Daniel's 70th week of his vision. We are not there as of yet. Praise the Lord. In its totality, we are within the first three chapters. Praise the Lord, as it were, um, not of Daniel's vision. I guess you could say that. Well, Daniel didn't see the church, but we are in the first three chapters of the church dispensation. We're not actually entered into all that, uh, into, um, at this particular, we haven't entered at all into the uh, 70 weeks as of yet. We are in the church dispensation. I guess I should, I should say it like that so I won't be confusing. Let's read here verse, John uh, chapter number uh, one, verse one. John here, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation deals with the church dispensation. The hereafter stars in the fourth chapter with the rapture. That's when Daniel's 70, 70th week starts because Daniel did not see the church. I should have said it like that. That makes more sense. You follow me? So let's read here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he, sig and he sent and signified it by his angel unto uh, his servant, John. Now, I made the point, excuse me, last week, those of you who have a Bible like me, you will see where it says, uh, uh, it says the revelation of St. John the Divine. Anybody have a Bible that says that? In the top of your heading? Okay, well, my uh, publishers of this particular Bible made a, made a mistake because this is not the revelation of St. John the Divine. This is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. And it was given to John to give to who? His servant. So what is the significance of you and I understanding the book of Revelation so that we as servants of God can know exactly what God is going to do in the end times? Okay, and now the book of Revelation, I guess I have to give you this. The book of Revelation is a book of symbolism. A symbol is the description of one thing given, uh, it's a, it is an image of one thing, excuse me, but it describes something else. It means something else. So many of the uh, signs that you're going to see and the imagery that you're going to see in the, re in the book of Revelation, is, it, it is one image, but it represents something else. You follow what I'm saying? And one of the first symbols that you see here is where he said his angel unto John. Now, this angel, and I'm going to show you later on in this particular book, this angel was actually one of the, one of the saints that had made the rapture and was glorified. Can the church say amen? That's in uh, Revelation 19 and verse 10. So you're going to see that later on here. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. And I already showed you saints that this book was put in here because um, this book was the most consistent book of any of those writings in that time that may have been more popular than, than uh, the book of Revelation. Um, and it was consistent with the other writers, praise the Lord, or the other books of prophecy. So they took this book, the translators, and put it into our holy canon. Can the church say amen? Verses number two, you with me? Read, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things he saw. Now, who's bearing record here? John is bearing record, and the angel here is showing him as he's caught up in the spirit, and he's seeing exactly what is going to take place in the last time. The, and the testimony of our Lord and Savior who? Jesus Christ. Now, a vision, I guess I have to give you this. A vision is different than a dream. Praise the Lord. John is in his prison cell on the Isle of Patmos, and he's caught up in, in, uh, caught up in the spirit as though he has made the rapture. And he is being carried through heaven 
by this angel, and he's showing him things to come. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, verses number three. Blessed is he that, that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So for those individuals who don't believe that the book of Revelation has no significance, your Bible said, blessed, blessed is he that readeth, and what? That hear, it, hear the words of this prophecy, what? And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, we are in the time where we are in the church dispensation. But once the rapture takes place, everything that John is seeing from there on is going to take place. And the 70th week of, Dan of Daniel is going, to, is going to start. Can the church say amen? So there's a blessing in reading. There's a blessing in hearing. And there's a blessing in keeping. This is the only book in the New Testament that is considered a book of prophecy. There are... 17 books of prophecy in the Old Testament, and there's one book of prophecy in the New Testament. But this book is certainly enough. Can the church say amen? Verses numbers four. Read. And John to what? The seven churches. Uh, yes, the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him who was and is and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, there were seven churches that actually existed in what was called in that day Asia Minor. They were as follows. They were Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These seven churches literally existed, but this speaks of the church in seven parts. Now, some have called it seven, the seven dispensations of the church, and that's not really accurate because the dispensation, saints, is a period of truth. And there is only one period of truth, the church dispensation. But this is the church in seven parts. Can the church say amen? We are in the last part of the church dispensation of, the, of 2,000 years, Sister Richardson, which is called the church at Laodicea. And you will note here he says, um, which... Him which is, that, that is him as God and his fatherhood. Him which was, that would be him as the sonship. And him which is to come as God. Read. Read. Then he says, from the what? Seven spirits which are before the throne. What is the throne? The church. This is symbolic language for somebody to say the church. Praise the Lord. And there are seven spirits. This is the one spirit in operation in each of the seven church periods. God doesn't have seven spirits. He has one spirit. But seven is God's complete number. And he's been operating completely in each of the seven church periods. You follow me? So this is the, this is the one spirit operating in each of the seven periods of the church. You follow me? Praise the Lord. I didn't lose you, did I? All right. Read verses numbers five. Read. And from Christ Jesus, uh, he says, and from Jesus Christ, who is what? The faithful, the what? The faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead and the prince of kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from, uh, excuse me, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, there are a lot of things in this chapter. Now, in the book of Revelation, you will see various descriptions of Jesus. And it speaks of him, saints, in different aspects. So when you deal with him as the faithful witness, this deals with him as, as the father. Let me show you some scriptures to make that point. This is verses number five, right? Let's go, uh, let me see here. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs. This deals with him as the creator and or the faithful witness. Because remember, when God made all things, he had what? No witnesses. So this speaks of him as a creator or the originator of all things. Let's go to Proverbs. Keep your hand in this, in this area right here. And I'm going to give you 
uh, some understanding on these various descriptions that we're seeing. So he is the faithful witness. The Bible called him in another place, the beginning of the creation of God. So let's go now to Proverbs chapter number 8, verses numbers uh, 27. We're not going to get that far tonight. We're probably only going to be in this one chapter. Praise the Lord. What did I tell you to go? Proverbs, right? 8, 27. We may have to go back a little bit. He is the faithful witness. And you remember this. I'm going to show you this scripture. The Bible said he made all things alone. So him as the witness simply speaks of him as the creator because there was nobody there with him. He witnessed what he did by himself. Can the church say amen? Let me, let me stop talking because I don't want to spend six months teaching this Bible class. All right, verses 27. Let's go back to 27. Read. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. Now, it would seem like we have, we have two individuals here, right? But this is the wisdom of God speaking. And the Bible said that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is simply God in his wisdom speaking of himself and what he did in creation. So he says here, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. Or I was there as the wisdom when I, God, prepared the heavens. These are not two persons. Because I'm going to show you in a few, minute, a few minutes that God did everything alone. And in one scripture, it talks about Jesus, saints, as um, the one that made all things, and by him does all things consist. Then it talked about God doing all things alone. So we can only deduce that the faithful witness is God himself witnessing to what he did when he made everything. Can the church say amen? So Jesus is giving a description of himself to John and saying, this is who I am. I'm the witness. I did all of this. Get the church say amen. Now let me give you something so you can understand how foolish uh, the Jews were. When Jesus was speaking to the Jews in the eighth chapter of the book, I think it was, of St. John, he began to speak concerning who he was. Now sometimes Jesus saint spoke as the father and sometimes he spoke as the son. And they told him, well, if you witness for yourself, your witness is not true. And Jesus spoke to them as God and said, if I witness for myself, my witness is true. You know why? Because I'm from above, you are from beneath. Ye are of this world, I'm not of this world. So the only one that can witness for himself is God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because none of us were there. When he did what he did. Now he's going to show you some things that he did. Now he's speaking of what he did in his wisdom. You follow what I'm saying? God created everything in the earth in his wisdom. Now what do you mean in his wisdom? In his perfect know-how of everything. God knew how far to, put a, to set the sun away from the earth. The sun is approximately 90 saints, 3 million miles away. And Sister Richie says, is this far enough for us not to freeze in the winter? Amen. And is this far enough for us not to burn up in the summer? Amen. And man has the audacity to say that he can do what he wants to do. So John is seeing God in his infinite wisdom. Praise the Lord as a faithful witness. Can the church say amen? I'm feeling good already. Read here. It says, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the deep. Read. When he established the clouds above. Now, in another scripture, you're going you're gonna to see, verses number seven, when we get there, that every eye is going to see him at some point at the end of the tribulation period coming in the clouds. He was the one that made the clouds. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. Man thinks he knows something. We only know what God wants us to know. Mm hmm Right? Clouds above. When he, sh when, read here. When he strengthened the foundations of the deep. Now, this is powerful here. What is the foundations of the deep? The, the waters that are underneath our feet. 
What he says? The fountain. I'm, I'm sorry, fountains. Thank you. The fountains of the deep. What is underneath your, your feet? Water. Praise the Lord. Wells, artesian wells. Because what happened when God allowed the flood to come? The Bible said the fountains of the deep. Thank you, sister, for correcting me. But the fountains of the deep were open and the heavens were open. There was water coming from beneath and there's water from above. And God made all of that in his wisdom because he knew that after he made man, praise the Lord, I think it would be approximately 1,600 years later or so, he would have to destroy most men from the face of the earth because of sin. Who knew, who did that? God did it. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. All right. When he gave to the sea its decree that the water should not pass his commandment. See, <laughs> praise the Lord. The waters go as far as God wants the waters to go. And if God doesn't want it to go any further, it stops. So when he says, I'm the faithful true witness, he's saying, I witness all of this because I did it. He speaks as him as the creator of everything. Now I'm going to show you another aspect in that verse where he speaks of his humanity because he's also the prince of kings. That speaks of him in the sonship. Praise the Lord because he is the what? God man. <laughs> I love him today. Do you love him? He, uh, let's, uh, that the water should not pass his commandment. Mm -hmm. when, he, when he, what? Appointeth the, found, uh, the foundations of the earth. That has to do with the solid mass of the earth. It does exactly what he wants it to do. Read. Then, he says, then I was by him. His wisdom was by him. Read. And as one, as one that was brought up with him. His wisdom was with him. His wisdom was in him. His wisdom was by him. And by his wisdom, he did all this. Can the church say amen? Now, think about it like this. I got to move on from this because we got to try to get through this chapter tonight. Think about it like this, saints. God knew just how much it took to be able to sustain man in the earth. He knew what type of ground to make that we would have be able to build upon. He knew what type of ground it would take to keep this building up. That he didn't make all ground the same. Because there's certain ground sharing that, that, that buildings can't be built upon. You can't build buildings on muck. You can't build buildings on sand. You have to build buildings on bedrock. Don't tell me God don't know what he's doing. So Jesus is telling John, I'm the witness. Now, you're going to see later that John never saw Jesus in this fashion. So when he looked at him, he says he was one like the son of man when he sees him glorified in his priestly garments. Because he never saw Jesus like this. He saw Jesus in the days of his flesh. But he never saw Jesus glorified. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God is in this building tonight. And John is giving us descriptions as he's seeing in his vision because he's caught up in the spirit and he's seeing exactly what God is going to do in the latter times. That's good enough for this here because we got to move on. Let me give you another scripture. Praise the Lord so we can move on from this. Let's go now to, to Isaiah. Then we're going to go to Colossians after that. Isaiah, chapter number 44. It's going to take me some time or us some time to get through this uh, particular lesson. Because when you teach in this fashion, it takes a lot of detail. And detail takes time. So we're going to deal with the details of this book. I don't know how long it's going to take us, but we're going to be here for some time, saints. We won't even get through probably this first chapter tonight. Let's go to the 44th chapter of Isaiah. This is simply to make the point, verses number 15, to make the point that everything that God did, he did it alone. So therefore, Elder, he can only be, he can only be the one that was a witness. And Jesus is the 
faithful and true witness. Nobody saw what he did in creation, but he himself in his own wisdom. Praise the Lord. What did I tell you to go? 44? Somebody say, get there, pastor. Thank you for encouraging me. 44 and 24. Now, Isaiah. Now, I said chapter 44 and verse 24 of Isaiah. I said, Isaiah 44, 24. Praise the Lord. Now, remember, some things that we're going to say, you're not going to catch it. Now, because I'm going to make some statements in this Bible class that is going to take some time for me to, to, uh, to deal with later on in the book. All right? So it's going to take some time. But by the time you get done with this, we get done with this study, you're going to have a clear understanding as to what is going to take place as Daniel asked the Lord in the latter times. Can the church say amen? Because we, we you and I, saints, have the privilege of being closer to the revealing of these, um, the, this 70th week or seven years. You follow me? Let's read here. Read. Thus saith the Lord, thy redeemer. Now, who is, the, who, who is he redeemer of? He's redeemer of Israel, and he's also the redeemer of the church. Read. He uh, that formeth thee from the womb. He's speaking of Israel in their infancy, because he was Israel's God. The Bible called Israel his firstborn. That would be in um, uh, Exodus 4 and 22. Now, if God's going to have a firstborn... There has to be a second born. Isn't that right? You wouldn't say, well, this is my firstborn son unless you're going to have a second one, right? Or unless you do have one. You follow me? Let's read. I am the Lord that maketh all things. So when, so when Jesus said, I'm the faithful and true witness, isn't that what he said? Or the faithful witness. It was the same God here, Jehovah. He was not known as Jesus at this point in time. He was known as Jehovah, the self-existing one, the immutable one, the one that changes not. Praise the Lord. Because if Jesus speaks of, of being a witness, and God, and we're going to get in a few minutes, that God made all things by him, and God said, I made all things alone, you can't have two people there because God said he did it by himself. So somebody say the Trinity is false doctrine. Praise the Lord, because God said he made everything by himself. And Jesus cannot be God's little boy. You know why? Because God made everything by him. And he said he did it by himself. I don't know why people don't get this. Read here. He says, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that what? Stretcheth forth the heavens with somebody else. Alone. Read. That that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So when Jesus said, I am the faithful witness, he's saying, I am the one who did it because God said he did it by himself. So the same one that's saying he witnesses is the same one that did it because the one who witnessed it had to do it by himself because that's what God said. I'm, you follow me? Now let's go to the, let's go to the New Testament and let me, uh, let me further um, legitimize this statement. Somebody say legitimize. Clarify, rightly divide, and show the world that this is the way it is. That the apostolics got it right. I know who I, I, know who I serve. I'm not trying to be cocky tonight. I'm simply trying to show us that we have the right thing. and We do not need to back up. John is seeing his vision, and he's seeing his God, his Savior, the creator of all the ends of the earth, Jesus. Now this is going to submit this, in, somebody say in stone. Verses 15, Colossians 1 and 15. Now keep in mind what we just read. So as we try to show you. How to deal with this. I told you we're not going to get through this chapter. I got about 30 minutes. 
Praise the Lord. All right, uh, let's read verses numbers 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? Or the one scripture said that Jesus Christ is the person of God. That's in, that's in the, uh, Hebrews chapter number one, verse three, I think it is, one or two, one or the other. It speaks about Jesus being the express image and the person of God. Or all that God was that he wanted to display to the world, he displayed it through the imagery of he, he himself in a body of flesh. The uh, image is a picture. The picture of God, who God was, the person of God, the personality of God, the attributes of God, the power of God was all seen on display in Jesus Christ. So in essence, Sharon, if, if there was no Jesus, there would be no way to know who God is because that is how God showed himself to man. You follow what I'm saying? All right. Who is the image of the invisible God? God is invisible. And so God has an image. The image of that invisible God is me? No, it's Jesus. Read. The firstborn of every creature. What that means is everything. Now, a creature, a creature is made by a creator. So the firstborn of every creature, everything or all that exists, the firstborn was Jesus. Or the body or the image that he himself would come in. So before God made anything, he made the image that he was going to come in first. Why is that? Because he knew since that he was going to have to come in an image so that he can save that which he loved the most. So God had who on his mind? He had us on his mind. When God gives his description, the Lord gives us a description uh, to the church of the Odyssey. The first thing that he says to the church of the Odyssey, right? The faithful and true image. The beginning of the creation of God. Every church age or church period, God gives a description of himself which shows how much knowledge or revelation that church period had. So we're going to get to that later. All right, let's read. And by this image or by this individual, by him, all things can, all, by him, were all things created. Or Jesus is the faithful witness as the creator because God did everything alone and he was the one, praise the Lord, that God did all things by. So therefore, Jesus is who? God. You follow what I'm saying? Did I, did I confuse anybody? Let's read here, all right? Um, whether are in heaven uh, uh, or in earth, visible or invisible, if you can't see it, God in Christ made it. Can the church say amen? Mm -hmm. Visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were made by him and for him. God made everything by himself and for himself. Some people say, well, Lord, I don't know why you made that. <laughs> How dare I tell God, well, why did you make that? Because I don't like it. Well, why did you make mosquitoes? Because I don't like mosquitoes. We've, said, we've all said that. I've been there. Praise the Lord. Why, what is the reason for this? Maybe the mosquitoes keep me praying. <laughs> I'm just being facetious. But the point is simply, God made everything for his own purpose. For his good pleasure, he did it. Somebody say his pleasure. God had pleasure in doing what he did, so he did it. Can the church say amen? And who can dispute him? Now, I'm spending a lot of time on this, but we need to drive home because John, every, see, every word in the Bible means something. God doesn't put anything in the Bible to fill up space. So he wants his servants, whom John is writing to, to understand who he is. Now, in this particular, the, the, first book, the first chapter of the book of Revelation, you will see a lot of descriptive language that deals with who God is. Why? Because the church needs to know who he is. Can the church say hallelujah? Now, as we move on, you will see him deal with the events to come. But here he's establishing where this revelation is coming from. Like I said, it's not the revelation of John. It is the revelation of Jesus. 
Can the church say amen? amen. All right, let's finish reading here, 17. And he is, and he is the, he is what? Before all things. Or be, he's before all things because he is creator of all things. Okay. Read. And by, and by him, all things consist. Or he is the one that made all things and everything consists because of him. So Jesus is the true witness because he made everything that consists. Now, he's going to tell you why he did that. Let's read here. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who, which is the, be, uh, what? The, uh, the, which is the beginning. The, f uh, the firstborn from the dead. Now, we're going to deal with that because he also gives us a description of that. That speaks of his sonship. Because he's the first one to die and to rise again of his own power. To prove that there is a resurrection and that those who believe in him can also rise. You know the reason why we rise? Because Jesus rise. So when Jesus got up, all nationality, races, creeds of people have an opportunity now to get, to get up. All five colors of the human family, red, brown, black, yellow, and what's the, what's the last? Red, white. Those are the five colors of the human family. And God came to save all of them. And you will find out, you'll find out when God makes up his church, it will be made up of all kindreds, nations, tongue, and people. And I say this all the time, and I mean this with all my heart. There's no such thing as a blue church, a white church, a black church, a green, it's God's church. I sit, sometimes I hear these, these political leaders talking about, we need to get the black church. No, that's your church. These people are going to go to the lake of fire. That's exactly what's going to happen to them talking about what let me get off that I'm about to get excited ain't no such thing it's not in the Bible God has one church and in his church there is no economic divides there is no uh, ethnic divides and there is no gender divides you know why because when he raptures the church he's getting souls and souls do not have a sex you follow me? There's no male souls, no female souls. <laughs> I don't know why people, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a kick out of this tonight. I don't know why people get this stuff in their head. Can the church say, if you cut me and I cut you, you know what comes out? Red. All nations of one blood. I don't have time to teach that Bible class. All right, let's read here. Now, why did he do this? This is the point we want to get to. He did this. He did. He created all things this way. That he, that in him, all things, he, excuse me, uh, he says that, uh, that in all things, he might have preeminence. Now, if you're making notes in your Bible, Sister Hayes, the term preeminence means first or supreme. God is first in everything that he does. He does not come in second. Now, let's deal with the last. Let's go back now to the book of Revelation. That's sufficient. I told you you won't get that far tonight. But that's okay. We, we went, we've read five verses. And it approximately took us, including the one in, uh, we started with, it's taken us almost an hour. Isn't that something to think about? But we've given you other supporting verses. So he says in verse 5, from Jesus Christ, who is faithful witness, the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. Now, this is another description, but it speaks of his, somebody say his humanity. Because here's the point. It has to speak of his humanity because a spirit cannot die. See, there's a doctrine that what we had a preacher that was teaching that, uh, that the father suffered on the cross. The father did not suffer on the cross. His righteous servant suffered on the cross, which we preach on Sunday night. The body suffered. You, how did it suffer? The body went to the grave. The body got back up. And they were teaching, this preacher was teaching that when, <laughs> this is foolishness. I guess I got to give it to you anyway. The preacher was teaching that when Jesus died on the cross, that God died. 
Listen to me. If God would die, the whole universe would disintegrate. Because he is life. And he's the life that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If the eternal spirit died, everything that he made would die. God is the common denominator that holds everything together. You see how people can get the Godhead and get these things mixed up? No, God did not die on the cross. The body that he was in died. And then three days later, 36 hours later, that body that he was in, he got back in and it rose from the grave. And he became the firstborn of them that slept. Y'all don't believe me, do y'all? Y'all believe me? So we go, I, I'm still going to prove it. Let's go now to Revel Let's go now to Romans. Romans chapter 8. He's the firstborn of them that slept. This speaks of him being the first begotten from the grave. Or first begotten from the dead, excuse me. He got up. And this is the thrust of this particular chapter. No, no, no. I, no, that's another chapter. Let me give you this here. Romans. Somebody say Romans. Let me see here. I got my notes here. Romans chapter number 8. Let me see what verse I want you to go to. Give me one second here so I can. Romans 8. Let me see. Well, Romans 8 and 29. I only want to deal with the latter clause of this verse. Then we're going to go take you to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 15. I think we also want that. Yes. This is simply to establish that as the sun, he rolls. Then I'm going to take you also to Isaiah and show you that God did not die on the cross, the body did. Can the church say amen? Now, God had to do this because in order for us to be kings and priests, as it's spoken of um, in the next verse, because he's a king, he's a priest, we had, he had to die, suffer, put us in the place that he was so that we can also have a kingdom at that time. Let me show you something here. Verse number uh, 29, read. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, there, there are six things that work together for our good, but that's not our subject. I simply want to give you this. That he might be the firstborn among witty brother. Can the church say amen? Now, he was the, no, let me give you this verse. That's not the one I want. That's another one. That deals with him on, um, that deals with him giving us an example in Matthew. This is the one I wanted to get you to. I gave you the wrong one. Let's go now to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Praise the Lord. That is my mistake. Praise the Lord. He is the firstborn among many brethren. From the standpoint of him rise, from the standpoint of him showing us how to be born again. But this, this is the verse that I actually wanted to give you um, that I should have went to first. First Corinthians chapter 15. And we're interested in um, verses numbers um, 19 and 20. That's my mistake. This is the one we actually want here. Praise the Lord. Because he's the first begotten from the dead. He's the first one to rise from the dead of his own power. He's also the firstborn of many brethren in as much. He's the first one to show us how to be born again. And he gave us that example at the rivers of Jordan. That's what that verse we just read dealt with. But let's read this here. Verse 19. Read. In, if in this life only we have opened Christ. Now what he is saying. Because he's trying to legitimize the evidence of a resurrection because in that some of them were teaching in that day that that there was no resurrection so he makes the point if in this life that we're in right now this saved life that we're in 
We, let's read here. Uh, he said that we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. If a man only hopes in Christ in this life, he's miserable. And most of our preaching today deals with this life. But Jesus did not die and become the firstborn from the dead or the first begotten from the dead so that we can live in this life. So if I'm hoping in Jesus Christ for Lexus, Lamborghini, Maserati, Porsche, Mercedes Benz, whatever you want to call, whatever your favorite car is, because sometimes people name their kids after what they want. Child can't even, don't even know how to uh, pronounce his own name. Lamborghini. How you spell that? Can you imagine a five-year-old child trying to, trying to spell Lamborghini? Let me stop. Praise the Lord. All right, let's keep reading here. Now, now this is the verse we wanted, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Now, read. And become the first fruit of them that what slept. So he is the first begotten from what? The dead. As what? The son. Not as the father, because the father didn't go in the grave. The body went in the grave. The father stepped out the body. The body died. Now let's go to Isaiah. One, one last verse. I'm trying, I'm trying to get through it, saints. I really am. <laughs> Somebody say, this is deep tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. 53. We just preached from this verse last Sunday. Isaiah 53. The spirit did not suffer. The body suffered. The spirit didn't go into the grave. The body went into the grave. Now God did this so that he could be intimately attached to his creation. Jesus said, the scripture said it like this concerning Jesus, that he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. How can he be touched with the feelings of our infirmities? Because he walked as a man. He talked as a man. The body died as a man. He purchased the church with his own blood. And you're going to see that also. He lets us know that too. Can the church say hallelujah? What verse do I want you to go to? Let me see here. All right, verses 11. Let's read. And he shall see the travail of his soul. Now that would be God in fatherhood would see the travail of himself in the sonship. As he's travail. This is what God did. When, he, when Jesus was on the cross, saints, God looked at that body as a sinner. The Bible said, he who knew no sin, Sandy, became sin for us. He was looking at that body and punishing it for the sins of the world. That was his son. But at that point, he didn't see him as his son. He saw him as a transgressor. He saw his own body as a transgressor, even though it did no wrong. And he put on him the, uh, the iniquity of us all. And he saw the travail. Read. Of his soul. And shall be what? Satisfied. This is him as the son. Praise the Lord. Or how can I say God as the father was satisfied in what he afflicted on that body. You follow me? Then he says, and by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. What was the righteous servant? That body that served the interests of salvation for the human family. So that when the preacher said that God died on the cross, the preacher has an illusion. Praise the Lord. This is what happens when preachers read books. <laughs> the Bible said to the writing of books, there is no end. You know my main book that I read is the Bible. The Bible is the book of books. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Revelation. Chapter number one. Praise the Lord. I've been on this verse all night, almost. And I have more scripture I can give you, but I'm not going to because we would be here for some time. So Jesus, as the Father did not die on the cross, the body died. Can the church say amen? The body was the first begotten 
or the first one to rise from the dead of his own power. Everyone else that has ever risen from the dead rose from somebody else's power. It was, remember you had Peter who, who uh, raised, who was that, Dorcas from the grave? That was by the power of Jesus. You had Paul when Eutychus fell asleep in church, fell back, broke his neck. And isn't that what happened? That's in your Bible. Y'all looking at me like, that's in your Bible. He was at church. I guess he didn't go to bed that night. But thank God that Paul was in the building. <laughs> so, let me get off this. Sometimes we fall asleep, and I walk by and shake, hit you on the shoulder. Don't do that, and you, you, you don't get sit up there on that upper loft and fall asleep, because we don't want to test that. Can the church say amen? But the point is simply this. Everyone else that has ever risen from the grave rose by the power of someone else or the power of God. Can the church say amen? Now, let's keep going here. And the prince of kings, verse 5. And the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. And the reason why he talks about him as a prince, because he's speaking of his humanity here. Praise the Lord. He's seeing him to this extent of his humanity and unto him that what? Loved us. Now, how did he love us? What? And washed us from our sins and his blood. So where did God get blood? Let me show you a scripture that makes that point. Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. I don't know why I have to give you all these verses, but I guess we simply have to show us these revelatory things in these scriptures so we can understand. This is Jesus in his multifacetedness. He's the Father, he's the Son. He's human, he's divine. Can the church say amen? John is seeing this, and he's showing us this great, somebody say great revelation. Chapter 20, verse 28. Then I'll take you, as we try to close here, because I only gave you five verses. Man, it's pretty rough, isn't it? But it's good stuff, isn't it? I'm going to give you this rather quickly. Then I want you to go to Luke chapter 2 also. You didn't know all that was in that one, that one chapter, that one verse, did you? It's in there. What did I tell you to go? 20 and 28, right? Now, we're only concerned about the latter clause of this verse. Verse. Read. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Now, he's speaking here to pastors. To what? Feed the church of God. Now, he's going to tell you how we became the church of God. Now, the pastor's responsibility is to what? Feed you cheeseburgers? Hot dogs, hamburgers? No. So that's the reason why we don't shut down the church on Super Bowl Sunday. Because who cares about a Super Bowl? You can DVR a Super Bowl. I'm coming to church. <laughs> hey Amen. I'm feeling good tonight. Y'all got to excuse me. All right? To feed the church of God, which what? Which he has purchased with his own blood. So the question has to be asked, where did God get blood? Because God is a spirit. He got blood from the human family. So when he speaks of him as a prince of the kings of the earth and him, as it were, dying for us and shedding blood, it speaks of his humanity. And the blood that was in that body came from the human family. Let's go now to Luke chapter number two. Praise the Lord. God purchased the church. If he purchased it, that means it's his. This church don't belong to nobody but God. I said, the church is ours. No, the church is God's. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I feel all right tonight. Let me, let me calm down. Somebody say, calm down. Let me calm down here. Now, uh, chapter number two. And verses number 34. We don't have time to read all of this. This is Gabriel speaking to Mary concerning 
the immaculate conception or the birth of our Lord and Savior, who Jesus Christ. It's simply supporting scriptures to make the point that he purchased the church. He bought it. And he took, and he took blood from the human family to get it. Seventy-five generations of women and 74 of men. The 75th would have to be God because he did not have a natural father. Y'all looking at me strange tonight. Praise the Lord. He did. Who was, God, who was Jesus' father? Joseph? No, God was. Can the church say amen? Verse number 34, read. Then said Mary unto the angel, this is Gabriel, read. How shall this be? What shall be what, what Gabriel just told her? Chapter number two. Chapter number one, I'm sorry, chapter one. One, I'm sorry, one and 34. I'm sorry, please forgive me. One and 34. See, I'm so excited, I need to, be, I need to calm down, Sister Richardson. Wife, I know, I'm, I'm going to get it right one day, sis. All right, verses numbers 34, read. Then said Mary unto, uh, unto the angel, how should this be? How should this prophecy that you gave me? It is referred to as the seven prophecies of Gabriel unto Mary. He told Mary of things to come. And that her son would be called, her child, excuse me, would be called who? One of the things he told her, the son of God, the Christ. Read. Um, uh, seeing, I know not a man. She said, now how could this happen if I've never been with a man? She was a virgin. She was pure. That's why I say pure. Read. And look at what the angel told her. Read. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of mm -hmm, the power uh, of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore the term therefore sister Hainer means for this reason because the power of the highest will overshadow shadow you this is what's going to take place therefore also that holy thing what shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. So when, the, when, he, when John, let's go back to Revelation. We're going to close with this. I gave you five verses. I got to speed it up. So when John speaks of him as the prince of the kings of the earth and the first begotten of the dead, he's simply speaking of his humanity. And where did God get his, where did God get blood from? He got it from the human family. And then Friday night, we're going to pick up with verses number six. Can the church say amen? Anybody have any questions about what we taught tonight? Yes. Yes.